Atlantic, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you today, today, to today's webinar. Uh, this is our last English webinar of the 2016-2017 series. Uh, the series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we are very pleased to be hosting Atso Romaganini, uh, who is a research scientist at the Natural Resource in Institute in Finland. His research interests focus on fishery science, including stock assessment, fisheries management, and population dynamics. The extremely poor situation status of the wild Baltic salmon and trout populations in the past decades has played a pivotal role in ATSO's research. ATSO has over 20 years experience in the fisheries research in Finland. He is currently a member of the ICES Working Group on the Science Requirements to Support Conservation, Restoration, and Management of, the, of Diadrum Species. Over his career, he has been involved in a number of other ICES Working Groups with emphasis on salmonids. ATSO is also an expert member of the uh, Finnish Nat National Salmon and Fish Passage Strategies, as well as a research expert in the Finnish delegate of the Tjornjoki Transboundary River Agreement. After the presentation, we will be beginning. We will be opening the floor for a question and answer session. You will have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in, and I will myself or Darla will read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Atso. Thank you, Sarah. I presume most of my audience is in North America, so good morning to you and good afternoon to the European audience. In my talk, I'm aiming at giving you an overview of the development of Atlantic salmon stocks in the Baltic Sea regions since the last century and focus on factors which are believed, believed to explain the development. I briefly also highlight some topical issues for research based on history and today's status in the salmon stocks. I assume some of you who are listening may not be so familiar about Atlantic salmon in the Baltic, Baltic region, its occurrence, biology, natural uh, conditions in the Baltic Sea, fishing and so on. Uh, therefore, I often stay in the basics in my talk, especially in the beginning. I will present some of the methods we use for stock monitoring, as well as other information, which is in close link uh, to Baltic salmon management. Due to this, I unfortunately, unfortunately have to leave out many details which may be of even higher academic interest for some of you. First, um, I show you a map of Baltic Sea Basin. The northernmost parts of Bal uh, Basin are located north of the Arctic Circle. And on the map I have marked the city I'm living and working, the city of Oulu. Baltic Sea is shallow and its water is brackish and the salinity range is ranging from 1 to 10 parts per thousand. The narrow and shallow dam straits usually prevent influx from more saline water from North Sea and there is a high freshwater inflow into the Baltic Sea from, from the catchment area. In old times, at least about 100 Baltic rivers sustained salmon populations. Basically, every middle-sized or larger river served as spawning river for salmon. About a century ago, people started to build up hydropower plants in the rivers on top of the already existing numerous smaller dams like uh, mill dams. This blocked salmon migration in wide freshwater areas, especially in the southern and middle parts of the Baltic Basin. 
Most large rivers were dammed also in the north. <clears throat> however, however, luckily, a few large rivers remained free, the largest of which is the river Tornioki watercourse. This river is called Tune Elven in, in Swedish. It flows between the border of Finland and Sweden, and it's a it repre represents uh, one of the, in old times, very usual sized salmon, big salmon rivers in the Baltic. Here I use River Tonyoki and the information from the Tonyoki salmon as an example because I know this case best and because Tonyoki salmon is one of the most closely studied and monitored Baltic salmon stock. As I said, Tornioki River system has no dams to block salmon migration. There are no natural obstacles either. The catchment is located in, in boreal and partly on subarctic zones. Uh, on the screen you see other information, basic information about the river. Apart from salmon, uh, the river system supports sea trout, uh, migratory whitefish, and river lamprey, which utilize different parts of the river system for reproduction. And then on top of that, we have a usual uh, composition of a, a northern Scandinavian fish species in, in the river system, perch, northern pike, grayling, burbot, several cyprinid species, etc. Uh, the river is covered uh, by ice uh, almost half a year, and and then in the spring time, uh, May June there is a big flood, after which uh, uh, the water level gradually goes down, and salmon runs into the river, postponing between the months of June, July, and August. Salmon par densities are annually monitored in, in the Tornioki main rivers by about 80 electrofishing sites, which are shown on the lower right corner of the slide. In the 1980s and already 1970s, based on irregular electrofishing studies, par densities were mostly less than one par per 100 square meters. But in early 1990s there was a slight increase in the densities and starting in 1997 the densities suddenly jumped five to tenfold higher levels. Density stayed elevated and during the past 10 years two more jumps have occurred. Now densities are about 50 times higher than in the worst years, in 1980s. This kind of development has occurred also rather similarly in other uh, rivers of the Northern Baltic Sea and uh, also in the different river sections of the Tornioki watercourse. In the, in the Tornioki uh, we are uh, monitoring small trends frequently since mid 1990s, and there were also some in, infrequent small trapping uh, in 1980s and early 1990s. The trap is set up close to the estuary of a 800 meter wide river, and the trap covers about 100 meters of it. Annual catches at the trap have increased from some thousands during the first years of the period up to 60 to 70,000 in the most recent years. Based on daily mark recapture experiments, the trap typically catches uh, 3 to 5 percent of the run, total run. 
statistical modeling of the par densities and the small trapping results provide a, a long time series of a small trap size. During the time series, the annual smolt abundance has increased from about 100,000 smolts up to about 2 million smolts. The shown estimates on the slide are from the analysis carried out before last summer, and that's why 2016 is regarded as a prediction here. But I can tell now that uh, last summer the trapping results verified that uh, the smolt run was 2 million smolts, even a little bit more than that. As a third example of Tonyoki monitoring results, I bring up hydrocaustic counting of salmon spawning runs. Uh, So-called Ditson sonars are installed 100 kilometer upstream from the sea since 2009. And the sonars de detect fish movements uh, across the river uh, cross-section except in, in the very deepest uh, mid-channel part. Uh, most of salmon tend to be uh, uh, migrating upriver uh, fairly close to the, to the river banks, so we don't think we are losing much of the total run in the counts. An identification of salmon from other species is based on size measurements, which in the case of Tonyoki is fairly reliable. Uh, spawning runs last for the three summer months, as I told earlier, and during this time there is almost uh, up-to-date uh, 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 updating of results uh, and published uh, on my institute's web Site. On the right you can get uh, the internet address to the web page uh, if you are interested to visit the site uh, next summer. Uh, in, uh, in, 19, uh, so, sorry, in 2009 and 2011, um, 20 to 35,000 spawners were detec detected by Ecosanders annually. However, since 2000 Twelve, the counts have ranged from 50,000 to 100,000 salmon. It's important to remember that total runs into the river are larger than those detected, not only because of the non-monitored mid-channel at the counting site, but also because there are spawning grounds as well as fishing on the 100 kilometer long river section below the counting site. This lower graph indicates estimated number of spawners in the Tornuki since the early 1990s. The results are from the ICS assessment model developed for Baltic salmon. Note that the, although the stepwise large increase since 2012 clearly stands up, stands up from the graph, uh, spawner abundance increased about 10 times larger already between the 1990s and the late 2000s. So the y-axis of the graph is a little bit misleading. Salmon abundance has increased fast also in other northern Baltic salmon, rib, uh, salmon rivers. Spawner counts at fish ladders in four other rivers serve as a demonstration of that. Uh, however, the relative increase has not been as steep in the other rivers than in the Tornoyoki. And these spawner counts uh, are mostly not uh, total counts either. Uh, the total counts uh, on, on, uh, cover Ume Vindelelven and Piteelven. When looking at the development of total estimated small runs grouped regionally around the Baltic Sea, increasing trends in the time series are steepest in the north, as shown in this slide. But there is also increasing trends in rivers flowing into the middle part of the Baltic Sea in the Gulf of Finland and uh, 
and southern Gulf of Bothnia. In contrast, there is no increase, but rather some decrease in the in the smog fronts among the southernmost rivers. This is an interesting finding, given the explanation about the Baltic white factors, which have most likely dictated the development of uh, Baltic salmon stocks. Note that the uh, y-axis in in these different graphs are. Uh, uh, are very different scale. I have shown earlier some results from the Baltic Salmon as Assessment Model and I <laughs> won't try to explain the modeling approach in this session because it would take far too long. I simply tell you that all the monitoring data I have shown as well as many other data sets are utilized in the model. One more such data set is tag recapture data. On the left panel here you can see tag recaptures of Tonegi salmon from various Baltic salmon fisheries during the last 15 years. Tag recaptures apart from identifying fisheries reveal migration roads, migration speed and timing of migration. On the right, I have sketched a summary of the migration roads of Tonoki Salmon at sea. Baltic Salmon are exploited by open sea, uh, so-called offshore fisheries on the feeding grounds, coastal uh, fisheries mainly using trap nets along the coastlines, estuarine fisheries, and finally by angling in the rivers. This harvesting covering sequentially all migration areas of Salomon has been in place since the early 20th century. The Baltic assessment model encapsulates the whole life cycle of Salomon. All these sequential fisheries and Salomon generations are linked in the model via stock specific stock recruit dynamics. The time series of fisheries of Tornioki salmon by these different fisheries uh, show how exploitation rates were very high in the early 1990s. In fact, this high ex exploitation started already around the 1960s, which led to the, the depletion of the wild stocks. From the early 1990s, harvest rate started to decrease and the decrease in the trend has persisted, persisted thereafter. The estimated cumulative mortality resulting from the sequence of fisheries indicates that only a few percent of the potential spawners reached their spawning grounds when Baltic fisheries was at its highest level. In contrast, currently at least half of the potential spawners reach the spawning grounds. This radical decrease in the exploitation is by far the most important factor which has pushed salmon stocks into recovery, according to our analysis. What are then the reasons for the decrease in exploitation? The short answer is that fisheries management of Baltic salmon has gradually improved and become more aimed at uh, more sustainable salmon fishing. Since the early 1990s, Baltic's, Baltic commercial salmon fishing has been internationally managed by total allowable cats, so-called TAC. In a graph, the line indicates annual TACs um, and the columns indicate nominal all nation commercial salmon cat seas in the sea. TAC was clearly restricting fishing in the early 1990s and again in the last few years. 
although it's not apparently seen in the graph, uh, TAC has to some extent restricted fishing also during the years between. TAC is divided into country-specific catch quotas by an allocation key, and uh, these national quotas have not allowed certain countries to catch as much as they would have caught without TAC-based management. Especially the offshore fishing on the feeding ground was suppressed by this TAC regulation. The political decisions about the size of TAC have gradually started to follow more closely the scientific advice given by ICS, which partly explains the decreasing trend of TAC in the graph. In addition to that, after mid-1990s, Finland and Sweden set up uh, uh, strict timely restrictions to the coastal trap net fisheries along the Gulf of Botnia. This allowed the increased number of salmon surviving from the feeding grounds to better reach their spawning rivers and not become caught by coastal fishing. So this coastal regulation strengthened the positive consequences of TAC management. Finally, the international ban of using drifting nets in the seas was enforced in the Baltic Sea in 2008. This terminated the era of very effective harvesting of salmon with nets at sea. Long lines have nowadays basically the only gear type used uh, for fishing on the feeding ground. What led salmon fisheries to such expansion and overfishing situation in the last century? The primary answer can be found in, the, uh, in this graph. In the mid 20th century, when building up new hydropower plants peaked, a method for compensation of the negative impacts of river regulation was invented. That is a large scale hatchery rearing of salmon smolts and their massive releases into the estuaries of regulated rivers. The amount of smolts released is based on the estimated potential smolt production levels of the rivers. In the graph, the amount of wild smolts produced in, uh, in the existing spawning rivers is very accurate, inaccurate for the decades before 1980s. And the amount of hatchery reared smolts is anyhow rather accurate uh, and is based on, on statistics collected from hatcheries. Hatchery reared smolts yielded very high catches during the first decades of the hatchery programs. Yields of up to uh, yields of uh, 1,000 kilo per thousand stocked smolts was quite common in those days. Baltic All Nation Landing increased, and it was its all-time high in the late 1980s, thanks to sea, this sea ranching. No wonder managers shared the widely accepted view that hatchery pro programs are the answer for successful management and the scarce of wild po salmon populations spawning in the few remaining spawning rivers can be ignored. Salmon at sea were hounded by competing fleets of uh, the nine Baltic countries and very few restrictions were enforced for sea fishing. Real change to this situation did not happen until 1990s when wild populations were literally in the verge of extinction, as I show you by the monitoring results. Uh, those days, most Baltic countries joined EU and awareness about the unsustainable situation spread and countries became more willing to negotiate about sustainable management.
another reason pushing politicians to the re-evaluation of their policy was the fact that in spite of still high level of fishing, salmon catches started to drop. Hatchery pro programs were not any more so successful. Scale and genetic analysis techniques were developed to separate wild and reared salmon from each other in the cats. To many people's surprise, uh, wild salmon accounted for more than negligible proportion at sea already in the 1990s, uh, before the recovery of the stocks. And when recovery really started, proportions of wild salmon quickly increased to 60%, even over 70% in the cats. In the graph you can see two sieve interface and three sieve interface uh, separately and, and uh, observed and modeled proportions of uh, uh, wild salmon over time. So these high proportions of wild uh, salmon in cats means that the wild smolts must have survived in the nature many times better than stocked hatchery reared smolts. The finding further strengthened the view that the remaining wild salmon stocks are invaluable natural resource which deserve to be safeguarded and rebuilt. Nowadays Baltic fisheries are practic practically fully dependent on the production of wild salmon in, in spite of still uh, going on uh, hatchery releases. As a summary, in spite of not very successful examples of salmon fisheries management in the world, I have uh, this <laughs> consolation to you uh, that uh, we have been able to witness how strongly reduced exploitation has been the driving force and the necessity to the recovery of Baltic salmon populations. I wonder if this is the best existing example of successful fisheries management of salmon. Another thing to learn from the past is that sequential fisheries as it uh, uh, was and still remains in the Baltic Sea intensifies the consequences both in good and bad directions depending on how good or bad is management. Uh, it was also, or it is very consolating also to see that uh, the populations in the northern Baltic rivers have sustained their potential for recovery. Although there was such a long era with overfishing and, and in some smaller rivers uh, some populations ceased to exist during this era. We have also learned that these lots uh, Baltic rivers can produce much more salmon than previously believed uh, and uh, uh, estimating the productivity and the maximum potential production of uh, salmon is r really challenging. Those estimates have changed many times in the Baltic over the decades. And uh, partly due to this uh, uh, miss uh, uh, leading estimates of the productivity of the rivers, uh, uh, compensation and mitigation effects of hydropower uh, production clearly needs a re-evaluation in terms of the magnitude and in terms of needed actions. Um, and there is uh, accumulating evidence that uh, the currently uh, employed hatchery programs are not a long-term sustainable solution, even for compensation for fisheries, not to mention uh, uh, sustaining a genetic pool, gene, gene pool of salmon. I do not have much time to tell you about current and future research challenges, but uh, now I briefly bring up a few issues. 
after overcoming the top priority problems with the conservation of uh, Baltic salmon, we can put more focus on examining the details of what uh, needs to be safeguarded and how. No doubt in the past, at least the largest salmon <coughs> rivers uh, likely sustained in river genetic substructure. My Swedish colleagues and I recently collected salmon par for, for genetic analysis from different stretches of the river Tonnöki and the adjacent uh, Kalix River. From tentative results, one can see spatial downstream upstream divergence in the genetic structure of PAR. There is also some evidence that salmon which were born in the upstream sections have on, on average earlier spawning migration into the river than those salmon which were born on the lower river sections. If this holds, it may have various consequences to fine-tuning of the regulation of river mouth and river fishing. Another and rather serious problem is the non-recovery of salmon stocks in the southernmost rivers of Baltic. Clearly much more information is needed to reveal the reasons, reason or reasons which are suppressing the recovery. To start with the identification of the likely location of the problems, whether they lie in the fresh water or at sea would help a lot. As you also know, there are several potential there are several potential survival bottlenecks for salmon in both of these areas. Occasionally occurrence of various salmon diseases have been reported in the Baltic region. In the last few years, considerable amounts of spawners have been found to die in some rivers during the summer as well as near the autumn spawning time. I personally do not know much about fish diseases and therefore I am not able to go into details of, of the phenomenon and the results of, results of the examined uh, and analyzed specimen. However, the fish uh, disease experts have so far not been able to come up with a definite diagnosis of the cause of recent deaths. Perhaps there is not just one reason for the deaths, as for instance indicated by the fact that some spawners have clearly got mechanical skin injuries, which are then infected by fungus and presumably led to dying but not all this, all the salmon have these founts. An inter interesting, only about one week old finding is a herpes virus found in some of the examined samples. Finally, I will take a step back to the middle part of my presentation where I told that clear improvements in the management of fisheries have le uh, led to recovery of the Baltic salmon. It's relatively easy to advise management to enforce fishing restrictions which initiate recovery. However, soon the tough question arises, how do we know that populations have obtained so-called good status? Where are we aiming at? How to define this goal or these goals? Most of you are certainly aware of the biological reference points created to aid fisheries management to define the management goals. This is, however, not <laughs> at all an easy task, especially in the Baltic situation, where there is a strong political will to keep all forms of salmon fisheries alive. This provision, if followed also in the future, sets complicated extra challenges for which fishery scientists are urged to answer. 
This was all from me. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators in the ICS uh, uh, working group of uh, Baltic Salmon and, and Trout. I like to uh, thank also my colleagues in the Natural Resources Institute Finland, Henni Pulkkinen, Tapani Pakarin and Ville Vähä, and my colleagues Stefan Palm, Johan Danevits and Rebecca Whitlock in the Swedish University of Agriculture and Sciences. Uh, the floor is open for questions and uh, please re uh, remember that my English is not very good. I would like to, uh, uh, if possible, get uh, written questions but uh, also if, if you can uh, ask questions loud and clear, I may be able to answer them. Thank you. So thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation and it's so encouraging to see the, the restoration that's happened. Um, so as that so said, we'll now open the uh, question and answer session. Um, to ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, if the box is minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to enlarge it. If you're using the audio of your computer, you can also raise your hand figuratively uh, using the yellow hand icon with a green arrow, and we can unmute you to ask a question directly. Or you also have the option of typing in your question on the control panel, and we can read it aloud, um, and at, so we'll be able to, to read it as well. So we'll give folks a few minutes to uh, enter their questions in. So the first question comes from Richard Businich. Um, so Atso, if you click on, um, if you enlarge your control panel and click on the uh, question line, you, it should open for you so that you can read the questions directly, uh, but I'll, I'll read his question aloud. He asks, can you elaborate? Uh, can you elaborate on fishways and passages? Yes. As a critical point in adult survival, travel delays, or smolt out migration survival studies? Uh, yeah, uh, there has been a number of studies on that in the Baltic. Uh, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, studies are still ongoing and, uh, and uh, therefore the results have not been reported much. But I think that uh, most of the published information uh, you will find from the, from uh, uh, from the river Ume Vindelelven in Sweden, where there is a uh, one big power station blocking salmon migration into river Vindelelven. Uh, but there is a fish passage, and that has been improved over the course of the years. There is also some uh, downstream uh, leaders for smolts uh, developed and installed. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we have observed uh, extra mortality for the downstream uh, migrating smolts. Uh, typically, we are talking about uh, a range of uh, 10 percent uh, up to several tens of percent extra mortality by one power plant, even higher numbers in some cases. And uh, uh, how successful the the few fish ladders have been in in guiding uh, upstream migration it depends so much on on the case and there is no simple answer for that thank you um the next question comes from anna Hagelin, um, who asks, what are your thoughts on sea trout in the Baltic Sea? I know that in some rivers they are declining in contrast to the salmon. Yes, um, it's actually quite divided situation with sea trout. Uh, uh, there has been very succe successful restoration and recovery projects uh, in the southwestern part of the Baltic Sea for instance, in Denmark, and, uh, 
and it's much about habitat improvements, it's much about uh, fisheries management uh, along the coast of uh, Denmark, also south, south of Sweden, the sea trout populations are in rather good shape, but the further you go north and east, the worse the situation becomes. And uh, for instance, in the river Tonyoki, which uh, serves uh, some sea trout uh, uh, populations, uh, there has been a similar long era with very depleted uh, population, spawning population size and very low par densities. Sea trout utilize the tributaries, smaller tributaries of Tonyoki river system for spawning. And uh, the problem in the north uh, and east it lies mostly in the uh, net fishing at sea, net fishing of uh, various species. It's a multi-species fishery using small mesh sizes because the, the target species uh, don't grow very large. And sea trout are mostly caught uh, by these fishery as bycats. And uh, this is really a serious problem here. On top of uh, these fishing problems, there are also habitat uh, habitat derogation, uh, degradation and, and, and uh, some projects uh, are aiming at improving the habitats. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Eyes Mangan. If I, I apologize if I'm, if I'm not pronouncing your name well. Um, the question is, what proportion of the spawning stock consists of aquaculture escapees in the Baltic Sea? <clears throat> we don't have uh, salmon farming in the Baltic Sea, thank God. <laughs> and so uh, we don't have escapees similar to, uh, uh, for instance, in the, in the rivers flowing into the, in, in, in Norway into the North Atlantic or West Coast uh, Sweden. So very few escapees, if any, and uh, most uh, hatchery origin fish uh, are from compensation releases stocking into the lower parts of the regulated rivers. There is some straying of those fish into the uh, nearby rivers, but the straying rate is usually very low, something like uh, 1%, 2%, which uh, corresponds quite well with the natural straying rates. But then there are also some um, different cases uh, where uh, nearby rivers may have uh, quite high proportions of hatchery reared fish in them. But in general, this is not a problem in the Baltic. Thank you. Uh, he says, uh, he or she says, you're very lucky. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Uh, the next question comes from Leif Helmer, uh, who asks, is there evidence in the feeding and spawning model that salmon encounter a dam on one of the large rivers? Will they explore a different river mouth to travel up and spawn? There is some evidence from the past, uh, like uh, when uh, suddenly a big salmon river was blocked with a dam built up uh, on, uh, near the estuary and tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands salmon tried to go up the river and failed, of course, because there was no fish ladder or anything similar uh, built up those days. Those times uh, salmon were found uh, in, uh, to wander around in, in the estuary area and uh, sometimes in the nearby rivers. Uh, they were a little bit wounded because they have been, you know, uh, knocking their head against uh, the concrete wall <laughs> in their home river. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm not aware of uh, any, any, any such, uh, such uh, uh, information where, where they are straying to the other rivers due to this kind of problem. Of, we have some, like uh, Ume Vindelel, when I told you earlier about with one uh, 
one uh, uh, dam, uh, but uh, the dam is some distance from the river mouth, and people uh, people say that uh, salmon tend to stay there below the dam; they don't leave the river. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Bruce Smith, who asks. You noted that much higher survival rate of wild smolts to hatchery raised smolts. Might this be the result of the quality of the released fish, such as fin condition? Have you tried semi natural rearing of fish to the smolt stage in ponds? Yeah, I was uh, prepared for a question and this task, and actually, I could try to show you if it's possible show extra slide on, on the survival of smolts over the postmot uh, stage. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, good. So, on the left side, you can see the survival of separately for wild salmon and for hatchery reared salmon, which is stocked as smolt at sea and uh, uh, x-axis is the stocking year. So these are the postmod survival estimates uh, as a time series. You see this uh, quite uh, conser <laughs> uh, serious decrease in, in, in the survival uh, until about 10 years ago and then some increase again. On the right panel you can see uh, the ratio in the survival between reared and wild postmolts, and uh, you can see that uh, earlier two reared smolts uh, equaled one wild smolt, while now you need three uh, reared smolts to equal one wild smolt. Uh, this uh, development, uh, we haven't, you know. Uh, been able to dig down deep what uh, has caused this and uh, what uh, uh, actually uh, makes the, such a difference between wild and hatchery reared smolts in survival at, at, in the nature. But of course, there is a lot of publication on this subject in, in the literature in general. Uh, reared fish are surviving much worse. We have recently also cultivated in a small scale uh, smolts uh, um, and also par in, in the more rich uh, hatchery environment. And the preliminary results of stocking of those fish into the wild indicate uh, that, uh, that uh, survival is clearly higher compared to the traditionally uh, uh, cultivated uh, hatchery smolts. I hope this answered uh, the question. Um, I'm not sure if I covered everything about, and uh, what was the interest of the person ask, ask, ask about this. Thank you. Um, Bruce, if you have a, a follow-up question, please feel free to enter it in. Um, the next question comes from Jenny Reed, who asks, what is the smolt to adult survival rate for salmon in the Baltic Sea? Okay, if, if uh, that means uh, over the post-smolt uh, stage, then the answer is here in, in this slide, what I show on, on the left. So we in the in 1990s, and it was about the same situation in 1980s that uh, that uh, 30, 40 percent of wild smolts survived to catchable size to one sea winter fish. But uh, then, uh, 10 years ago, uh, a bit less than 10 percent of, of uh, smolts survived. And now we are again back in about 15, 20, even 20 percent in, in the very last years in survival. Uh, but uh, if the question is about uh, from small to returning spawner, uh, the answer is that uh, uh, 5 to 10 percent of smolts survive back to their spawning river after sea migration. 
most of smolts uh, don't come back as grills, but uh, instead they come as two sieve interface or three sieve interface. So the average size of this and H is uh, quite high in, in, the, in the among the Baltic spawners. They are seven eight kilo uh, weight in weight on average. Thank you. Uh, the next questions come from Rick Simpson. Uh, Rick, Rick asks, uh, "These are are, the, are these what we call Atlantic salmon found in rivers in the Canadian uh, Maritimes in eastern Canada, or are they another salmon species?" And the in-out migration map is interesting. Do these salmon ever stray out as far as the Atlantic Ocean beyond the Baltic Sea? Yeah, uh, I was also prepared for this question and uh, uh, here is a little bit old but I guess still valid uh, dendrogram showing uh, the, 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 the genetic structure of a North Atlantic European salmon in the Baltic Sea and, and in the, in the Europe, Europe, uh, European rivers flowing into the, into the North, uh, North Atlantic. Uh, it's pity that I don't have Canadian uh, salmon here, but uh, the short answer is that, that we are talking about same species, but uh, different genetic lineages. In the Baltic Sea, we have a so-called Eastern Baltic Sea lineage, and a Northern Baltic Sea lineage, and finally Southern Baltic Sea lineage. So there are quite big differences in genetic structure between these three groups. On top of that, uh, in the Baltic and Russian Karelia area, we have land, landlocked salmon, which also differ in their genetic structure. And uh, uh, rivers flowing into the Atlantic Ocean in uh, Europe form Eastern Atlantic uh, Barents Sea and White Sea lineages. And I suppose uh, North American salmon again differs similarly and makes one makes up one extra branch, at least one extra branch into this dendrogram. Um, what was the other question? Sorry, I forgot that. Uh, the other question was whether or not these salmon ever stray out as far as the Atlantic Ocean right. beyond the Baltic Sea. Right, they almost never uh, stray. There is no uh, migration through Danish uh, sounds in either direction. Uh, uh, only in case when the Danish uh, hatcheries tried a uh, special way of releasing hatchery at Smoltz uh, in 1980s, we saw some straying outside uh, the Baltic Sea, mostly on the western coast of uh, Sweden and the rivers flowing there. They uh, kept uh, smolt sized fish in the net net pens in, in the sea and fed them over the first summer and then released them and tho those were straying here and there but uh, otherwise uh, there is no migration across the, the straits. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Amanda Babin. She asks, has there been much, much research on adult to kelt survival and their migration back to sea? Yeah, not much, and there should be much more studies on that. Uh, it, uh, I could have mentioned uh, this, uh, this topic uh, uh, as one uh, where we could put a focus now that we have, uh, we have been able to uh, see the, the recovery of the, of the salmon populations. Uh, we have, uh, we, of course, we have observations on Celts, and uh, we also monitor proportion of repeat spawners in the spawning runs. Uh, we collect uh, something like thousand cat samples from the Tornioki fisheries annually, and uh, there we can see uh, currently uh, about 15% uh, of these cat samples are from repeat spawners, second, third, or even fourth time spawners. And uh, hundred years ago, the same percentage was uh, between uh, five and ten. 
So I think the lower fishing pressure has given space for salmon to reach older age. And that way, uh, older age virgin spawners and also repeat spawners have become more abundant proportionally in the spawning runs. Uh, and uh, uh, when uh, kelts die, how they survive through the turbines, if there is a hydropower plant uh, uh, un, uh, below the spawning grounds and so on, uh, we don't have much information on that, un unfortunately. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Rick Simpson. Uh, he writes, we have the example here in the Okanagan of the Columbia River uh, sacrifices to hydro, irrigation and flood control. So managers and engineers are now bending over backwards to improve uh, mostly court ordered passage past dams using all sorts of migration methods. Do the Baltic rivers with dams try to ac accommodate salmon migration at all? Um, depends a bit on, on, on the country. Uh, the, most of the hydropower plants were built up uh, in the last century and the mi early or middle part of the last century. And in those days, the core decisions on the uh, compensation, mitigation, and uh, you know the terms of uh, for the for the power company how to build up a, a hydropower plant uh, was uh, not based much on much research information, and uh, usually there was a, a obligation to build up a fish ladder when there was a ban, dam constructed. Uh, but uh, those um, fish ladders of uh, fish elevators were often built up. They didn't uh, uh, work in most cases. In some rare cases, they were working quite well. And then uh, afterwards, uh, it's really depending on the country's legislation whether the, the, these core decisions can be opened and how often they can open and uh, and reevaluated and new decisions made. For instance, in Sweden, uh, uh, they have recently uh, had court uh, processes for several uh, regulated rivers, uh, and uh, there uh, the court has. Uh, uh, decided on, on uh, clearly larger scale uh, mitigation and, and uh, compensation uh, activities than, uh, than the, uh, decades ago. In Finland, uh, uh, basically the core decisions are valid forever, unless somebody uh, uh, disagrees and set, uh, sets the request to the court system that uh, that we have to renegotiate. Uh, we have started this kind of processes in Finland and they are and none of them have uh, uh, have been finalized yet. So it depends. Thank you. Uh, we have one uh, last question from Anna Hagelin who asks at what level do you estimate the egg to smolt survival? Um, yeah, uh, that depends very much on, on the status of the population give, uh, against the carrying capacity of the of the river, the potential production capacity of the river. Uh, when the salmon populations were in in very low poor status, uh, two three percent of the eggs survived to small small even four percent in some cases. While uh, nowadays, like in River Tonoyaki, uh, the estimates range around uh, 0 0.3 to uh, uh, 0 0.5 percent survival. And this displays the, the effect of uh, density dependent mechanisms. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you so much, Atso, for this uh, presentation and the question and answer period. Both were absolutely excellent. Um, and a thank you to everyone who joined us today. A little reminder that our next webinar is going to be held on February 22nd. Uh, Thomas buffin belanger of the University of Quebec at Rimouski will be making a presentation on the hydrogeomorphic assessment of watercourses. Uh, please note this webinar will be in French. So thank you again to ATSO and for everyone to participate uh, who participated today. We hope you'll join us again very soon. Thank you very much. This was